final part of Colossians, chapter 4, from verse 2 to the end, with the title, Serving God Together. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Anisimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. <coughs> After this letter has been read to you, see to it that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. What I noticed, what seemed to jump out at me, was verses 9 and 12, where Paul identifies Onesimus and Epaphras as one of you, that is, Colossians. And verses 10 and 11, where Paul identifies Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice <coughs> as being the only Jews among my fellow workers. And I wondered why would Paul make this distinction? Because in the same letter, at chapter 3, verse 11, he wrote, there is no Greek or Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Is Paul deliberately causing division here? Is he contradicting himself or has he made a mistake? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. So it can't be a mistake. God is a God of order. Right from the beginning of the Bible, starting at Genesis 1, God creates the heavens and the earth and establishes order in the universe. Through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, God sets out his laws and order for his nation Israel. And Jesus himself says in Matthew 10, 30 and Luke 12, 7, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. What an amazing God we have. He creates order from the vastness of our universe.
right down to each single person in it. And the church is no different. There are many scriptures in the New Testament advising, directing and correcting order in the churches, both through our thoughts and actions as individuals and corporately. From the teachings of Jesus right through to the first three chapters of Revelation. In Colossians, I believe Paul is confirming and establishing order within this new young church. It's a continuation of 3.18 onwards, where Paul gives instruction to wives, husbands, children, fathers, slaves and masters. He identifies Aristarchus, Mark and Justice as the only Jews among his fellow workers to make the church aware that not all Jews were believers in Christ at that time, or even now. And to enable the church to know what role these men play and what their giftings are. As Jewish believers in Christ, they would have great knowledge and insight into the scriptures and experience in the customs and cultures of the laws for the new church, drawn from their past experience in the synagogue. <laughs> Remember that at this time, the early churches only had what we now call the Old Testament to learn from, and the verbal accounts passed on from those who were with Jesus. Paul also identifies Epaphras and Anesimus as Colossian believers for similar reasons. He's affirming them as people who are trustworthy in their faith, but who also understand their own culture and ways of life. Before we united one church and Norwich Eden Church were two distinctive churches. We had different church cultures and different styles of church service, even though both churches share the same faith. We initially identified ourselves as either one of us or one of them. It took time to get to know each other, to learn about each other's giftings and roles, because church is about relationships. And that's my second point, is a church that is alive, active and growing is likely to be a messy church. The word mess doesn't actually appear in the Bible, so what do I mean by it? The church is made up of imperfect people living in a fallen world where our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That sounds pretty messy, but God is with us and works through the mess. Today we remembered those killed in the Bumba massacre, the devastating event, that we saw that God worked through that situation. It's important to remember our roots and where we've come from, to honour those who have gone before us, who have passed on the baton, because we learn from our past and it enables us to look forward into the future. I wonder if you've ever been one of the last people out of a cinema and noticed the empty wrappers and bottles lying around for someone else to clear up. Well, that mess is only from a few hundred people. But in the Gospels, after feeding the 5,000, the disciples collected up 12 basketfuls of leftover bread and fish. Must have been a bit of a mess. But there was order in the mess, and Jesus was there. Amen. When the disciples took Jesus down from the cross to wrap him and place him in the tomb, it was messy not only physically, but emotionally. They would have been covered in his blood, <laughs> probably feeling disillusioned, full of grief and confusion, this was not the way that they expected things to end. Our expectations don't always align with God's order. 
on the day of Pentecost, when around 120 believers suddenly began speaking in tongues, the crowds were bewildered, and some said they were drunk. Can you imagine 120 drunk people? Yet both of these events, Jesus' death and Pentecost, were prophesied many years before in Isaiah and Joel. The Toronto blessing in the 1990s was criticised by some as being a counterfeit revival because of the nature of some of the manifestations occurring. Yet research demonstrated that 90% who attended the meetings said they were more in love with Jesus than they had ever been before. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. But as a note of caution, we have to temper that with 1 John 4, where we are also called to test every spirit to see whether they are from God. For us in this country, messy church has come to mean that once a month the children get to use paint, glue and play-doh. And I wonder, is this how messy we want to get? Or should I say, is this how much we want to grow? Is this how much we want to be alive and active as a church? Mess involves individuals too. In this scripture, both Paul and Aristarchus are in prison for their faith. I wonder how we as a church would react if Pastor Sam and a few others ended up in prison because of their faith. Across the world, there are still Christians tortured and imprisoned. But God works through them. And I also would encourage you to read The Heavenly Man by Brother Yun because he offers a very interesting perspective on imprisonment as a Christian. Onesimus came to Paul as a runaway slave, condemned for his actions. But Paul points him to Christ and on his conversion, he writes to his master Philemon, saying whatever Onesimus owes him, Paul will pay and he sends Onesimus back as a free man. For that is the power of Christ in our lives. He sets us free. And if you want to be set free this morning, then you come to Jesus. In Acts 15, 39, Paul and Barnabas have such a sharp disagreement over Mark that they part company that the grace of God was with them, and we see in Colossians 4.10 that reconciliation has been made. Paul himself was physically in chains, yet he declares he is free in Christ. And over the years as a Christian, he'd been an evangelist, church planter, healer, teacher, preacher, and pastor. He's learned to be joyful always, to pray continually, and to give thanks in all circumstances. And although confined physically, he has developed a way to continue his work to advance the kingdom of God. And for those of you of a more mature, more mature age here, who may be suffering physically, I want to encourage you this morning, because God hasn't finished with you yet. And if you're sitting here this morning feeling as though you're in a mess, I encourage you to look to some of our more mature church members, seek them out for advice, because they have a wealth of knowledge and experience not only of life, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> but also in spiritual matters, and they can help you to get through your messy times. When I first became a Christian, the minister at the church I joined used to say that the church 
was the only organisation that exists for its non-members. And recently I stayed in a hotel on the fourth floor, so I had a good view of the area outside my window. Immediately below me was a bar in the shape of a capital T. I was at the base of the T, and on the top left was an outside seating area for customers. And down on the bottom right side, hidden from the customers, all the rubbish and empty barrels were stored. In the quietness of the first morning, when there weren't any customers, the bin men arrived and took away the rubbish. And soon afterwards, and every morning, another van turned up to take away the empty barrels and replace them with full ones. And in the evenings, other customers would always be there, perhaps having had the place recommended to them by those who had already been. The mess and rubbish were generated because of the customers. The bar exists for the customers. If there weren't any customers, there would be no rubbish or mess, and the barrels would never become empty, and eventually the bar would cease to exist, because it would not be fulfilling its purpose or what it was designed for. You see, a messy church is a natural outcome of getting involved with our non-members, or as Paul says here, outsiders. It's only through our involvement that others will come, because it's what we were designed for, to share the gospel message. And our mission is more important than our mess. God is not offended by the mess. He is in it with us. He's not offended when we are spiritually empty, because in the quiet times we can go to him to be refilled and to hand him our emotional rubbish so that we are ready to reach out again to those who don't yet know him. How do we get ready to serve God together? and our community. Well, we just have to go back to that verse 2 at the beginning of that chapter because Paul gives us the answer. <coughs> he says, devote yourselves in prayer. That's communicating with God first and foremost. Be wise in the way you act and let your conversation be always full of grace. So if we direct our communication with God first, out of that time, our actions and our conversations will come in a godly and orderly way. Amen. Amen. Amen.